September, I don't know, but fortunately, Andrew Quo does not know the meaning of the word vacation. What's up? I have not left my vicinity all summer. You are stagnating or bolstering? I'm definitely bolstering my position. Uh, I have not left like my uh, couch desk studio routine in months. What about pivoting? To vacation. What do you mean? Like, uh, do do I transition to uh, a, a different routine, or do I make plans to leave this damn country? Yeah, your brand for so long has been not on vacation, unlike Jordan Rodelli. <laughs> what if you pivoted to being like vacation quo? I know, right? Like for years and years, I was always the guy that never left New York, and then somehow, like, I wrote down on a piece of paper all the places I've been to. I'm not complaining, man. I've I've seen I've seen some things, man. Not as much as you. I, I definitely not as much as Dietrich. Uh, you, so you've been taking secret vacations, like in between recording episodes of Cookies. Like the whole idea of the staycation thing is so '90s, right? It's just like I went on vacation, but all I did was like explore my house. Uh, so that yeah, I kind of do that. I live in the '90s. Well, yeah. So apologize to the. <laughs> the listeners. I mean, I apologize to the listeners. It was my fault. And um, I was on vacation in a Bradelli esque excursion last week. And I went you upstate. You had those hot dogs upstate. Yeah, I got the dog dish out, filled it with some, you know, nice Bombay sapphire, laid the hot dog legs across it. It was great. <laughs> How's upstate, man? It was nice. The, the one takeaway here, and, and we went through a few different little towns, and we were on the um, western side. So there's a few places like Andes, New York, or uh, Calicoon. They don't have cell phone reception in the actual town itself. So you're saying there's like no Wi-Fi towers, no nothing. There's like no local network you can jump on. I'm not sure. You know, people have Wi-Fi. So you'll go into a restaurant and the Wi-Fi will be, um, you know, up there on the wall prominently, kind of like in Europe or maybe like back in the day. But people don't use cell phones. And it's interesting because the whole idea of going off the grid and going upstate, and then it's surreal when you're sitting there in a restaurant and you can't use your phone. You get out of the car and you can't use your phone. You're just like, oh, this entire little downtown with restaurants and small bars and shops, no cell phone service. So what it's you're telling bizarre. What you're telling me is like teenagers from... Calicoon, New York, aren't on Instagram or TikTok. They're just like living their IRL lives. I don't know. It is a little bizarre, though, because we're so connected all the time. And I assume these kids are when they go home, when they're at school, blah, blah, blah. But they can't walk around with their cell phone, as far as I can tell. There just is not service in the town, not like in the middle of the mountain range, in like the on Main Street. How is that possible? How do, like, banks do business? How do restaurants do business? Like, all, we are living in a, in a zone of Wi-Fi, right? Like, you need all these things to run a hardware shop. I agree. It was, it was bizarre. I did not know that there were actual population centers that were still trapped in, I don't know, like, 1992? You're painting like, well a picture. before the NBA even started? Like, what I'm imagining based off of what you're telling me is kind of like the plot to the invasion. You know, like when you're hanging out and it's like, why does everything look like it's from 1940? How come no one's eating food or breathing air? And then they're like bleeding green juice from their ears. It's, well, it's like pre-Iversonian. You know? Oh, wow. It's hard to even fathom it. And yet you're there. 
That's and when the, the NBA was kind of more jazzy. Or there was no NBA, and basketball was jazzier. <laughs> the game was a lot. <laughs> Loose. Like free jazz. <laughs> right. Let me shoot this one-handed <laughs> shot with on my <laughs> left leg. <laughs> oh, look at the soloist. Get ready for this twirl. <laughs> I, I guess for all of the many big-time Hollywood you know, screenwriters who listen to cookies dutifully <laughs> and religiously, these upstate towns in the Catskills would be ideal for, I don't know, a, an invasion from, say, communists or North Koreans or Russians because the Aliens, lack of dude. cell phone service you know, in, in, in 2019 right. is, is really a great wrinkle that... In, in many ways, enables you to have your, your cast living like like Seinfeld. <laughs> you know, like half of those episodes could have been solved if someone just, you know, picked up a phone. Like the most famous episode that kind of launched the the whole series, which was the, the Chinese restaurant one, right? George has to wait for a phone call back on the payphone as they're waiting for a restaurant, which was mildly racist, but like not really. Uh, they had a caricature of a Chinese guy, like, as the host of the restaurant. And uh, George was trying to get a call from a new lady friend, and people were occupying the phone. And the whole episode was about the tension of those interactions. Like, when is our table ready? Can I get to this phone? Is someone on the phone? Please get off the phone. Uh, if you had a cell phone, that whole thing doesn't exist because you've already resied your table. Yes, I, I think in general a lot of those episodes were due to miscommunications because you couldn't update the information that someone else had. But also, that, that did not age well, but it doesn't really hurt Seinfeld. But to kind of to your point before, I do think what stands out now when you watch episodes of Seinfeld is the accents that sort of non-native English speakers use are a little gross. And it's interesting, right? Because, like, I've been on my soapbox before about this. Like, it's just Asian men. So all the Asian men in that show are, like, delivery guys or uh, restaurant people. And they have these heavy, heavy accents, which doesn't bother me at all because immigrants have heavy accents. And it's part of New York. But, like, George is always sometimes, or Jerry, is dating an Asian woman. And she's, like, a lawyer with no accent. So I, I, I always thought that was funny. Coming from, like an Asian man point of view. Like, where's the Asian guy on Seinfeld that just, like, speaks like they do? Right. I, I also just felt they were over the top, you know, whether it was, like, um, you know, the guy working in, like, the Middle Eastern restaurant or Pakistani cafe or whatever it was near his house. It's like every accent is just so... Um, I don't pronounced. Know, it's just car It's just car Yeah, it's overly pronounced. It's cartoonish. And I feel like someone later talked about how he didn't want to use this accent and they ended up like not casting him or something that they were like, no, 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 you have to use this, you know, insane like Latino accent or whatever right. it is for your character. I mean, it's so interesting because like the 90s was like, that's when we kind of figured out like, that's when we all thought we were super smart and we're like, oh, it's semiotics. You know, you, you have to show somebody the caricature of it in order to like define roles within like a pe time period of a story, like the WWF and whatever. Uh, villains, you know, just like creating kind of these tropes so you can get to a punchline faster. And uh, it goes back to the, the Apu controversy with The Simpsons, you know, like when The Simpsons first started, it was a different time. Uh, <laughs> and we didn't really think that much about that character unless you were, you know, it was the character that represented you on Earth. And then well, maybe you had thoughts about it. But then everything shifted where we kind of realized, like, that was not okay. But I agree, though. Simpsons, incredible show, obviously one of the greatest of all time, but same kind of deal, especially with, like, the sort of ethnic humor that it employed in that era, it was just a different time. And we always mention friend of the pod, Jason Williams, making jokes that right. felt very retrograde because they were trapped in that, in that same dynamic of like, we're going to call out our differences and that's funny and that's interesting. And maybe we don't need to do that because that's just accentuating how we're different. I don't know. I don't, I mean, the, yeah. The Sim Simpsons did not weather the sort of, 
modern era particularly well, and whether it was Apu or the Chinese restaurant on that show. Right. And it's tough, right? Because a, a lot of people recently have, like, tried to change the way we tell jokes. And, you know, we get, like, Chappelle and Hannah Gadsby, like, doing their thing. And they have different points of view. And they're trying to update this this form of art. And, like, you know, it was just announced that uh, Netflix had given Eddie Murphy a big pile of money to do some specials, which is, like, incredible. As somebody who grew up with, like, Eddie Murphy being, like, biggest star in Hollywood and his stand-up being, like, the funniest thing I've ever seen, it was really exciting. But then there was kind of a pushback being like, oh, is is his sense of humor going to work? Like, he could be the voice of a donkey on an animated in an animated movie like Shrek, but does he work on stage anymore? Has Have things changed so much where, like, it has a different kind of danger to it. For sure. And we've seen guys who seemed completely in tune with the current moment, like um, like Louis C.K., all of a sudden seem deeply out of touch with it. And it's amazing. He was sort of viewed as our most sort of truth-speaking comedian that had this total grasp on, on that fine line between what was offensive and, and what was progressive and, and how do we navigate these. And that was really what he mined for humor a lot of the time. And all of a sudden, he just seems completely out of touch with that. And it happened over the course of like a year. Yeah, for sure. And uh, this week, I just watched the, the Julio Torres special on HBO. And this is like, this is funny, right? I can't tell if he's like 35 or 25, but I just went through his resume and like he does that HBO show with Fred Armisen called Loss of Spookies. And he's been a writer on SNL. Um, uh, I think Fred Armisen and Lorne Michaels produced this HBO special and it is fantastic. And it is G rated and it feels very now. Um, no spoilers, but what he does, it's very futuristic looking. The production design is hilarious. He gets up there with like a, a shiny suit and he has a conveyor belt and it's called My Favorite Shapes. And different things come out on the conveyor belt and he's like, oh, look at this. Okay, I need to talk to you about this. And it's one thing after another of him identifying these like objects, but there's no like uproarious laughter and there's no punchline. It's kind of like, for better or worse, a, a vibe. And... It's so funny, but I never laughed. Would you once. say that it's a a big mood? It is a huge mood. Hmm. It what he's presenting is like. Is it a whole mood? <laughs> it is a whole mood, but it's hilarious and uh, and it's not without its connections to history, right? And like that's what kind of makes like basketball players great when they do these new things, but you could still kind of see. Uh, the progression of where they came from. Like, Giannis is an evolution of things we've seen before. Like, I always think of Rashid Wallace when I see Giannis, kind of, you know? And that's the joy of it. Um, they call him the freak, but it's it's like Ben Simmons is Magic Johnson. Like, I think it's more like Freak Van Horn. <laughs> Everybody is, uh, to a certain degree, Keith Van Horn, from a scale from 1 to KVH. But uh, the Julio Torres thing was interesting because, like, so he brings out these objects, and he seems new. Like, he's presenting himself as a, a new kind of generation. Uh, like, obviously, with, like, his set design and jokes and, like, but then as soon as you start thinking about it, like, this is the Conan O'Brien, like, in the year 2000 bit. And he brings out these objects, and it reminded me of the Seinfeld uh, Fusilli Jerry joke. You know, which is like, here is this object that I've created in the context of like whatever the the situation of the the medium is. And then I'm going to recontextualize this object for effect. And I think Larry David constantly does this in Curb Your Enthusiasm and Seinfeld. And Jerry Seinfeld kind of plays along. Um but it's something that is deeply rooted in like a 90s joke. You know, there was the armoire, the, the marble rye, Fusilli Jerry. Um, there was that stolen statuette. Uh, the, the junior mints. The junior mints. Like all these things revolve around these objects. And like 
not to get in over my head, like I think about this constantly as someone who creates like junk in this world, you know, like here's another t-shirt, here's another painting, you know, here's another sculpture. And it's just like, well, what am I doing? I'm just like introducing this new thing. And I thought the really funny thing with the, the Torres special was like, he was taking these old things that he found. And then also these things that he made, like these little dioramas in order to show you a joke. And it was like, uh, it was like Gallagher, right? You know, like the comedian with the hammer and the watermelon. Stand-up comedy is one of those industries that I definitely feel completely out of touch with these days. I think we all sort of saw the um, progression from a performance level of that kind of, I don't know if it was like three or four or five or who they were, but it was like the Eddie Murphy and the, and, and the George Carlin. And then you had... Chris Rock, and you, you had this, this progression of the guy, Dave Chappelle, the guys who were the big dogs of the genre to Louis C.K. I don't really know who's doing the, like, who, who's the, who is the cutting-edge stand-up comic of today? Who is it now? Well, I, I only have a window into this because, like, I have a buddy who is obsessed, so I'm privileged to go along with him to a lot of these things. And, like, I don't know. But, like, there was a Hannah Gadsby um, moment you know where she she had that great stand up about like i mean it was kind of a cool thing her her premise was like if jokes are funny on a degree of suffering then we should probably end laughing because we should probably try to curb suffering and it was it was a cool premise but it was just like well then like then what are we doing now is this still comedy and i thought that was a good discussion all that's changed a little bit um since then, that came out like two years ago. But it brings me to another documentary that I saw this week. I had a big week, Ben. You were um, upstate gallivanting around Yao Ming sculptures. I couldn't even get online, man. What do you want from me? <laughs> you were hanging out with... Uh, I did see the Yao Ming statue, though. Yeah. It's, I can't remember exactly where it is. It's near Liberty, New York. But I was driving along, and all of a sudden, I look at someone's yard, and there is a looming figure. Why Yao Ming, man? No idea. I Googled it. Apparently, he is an artist who's shown some work down in the city, but he lives up there and is with his father, who's also a sculptor, and he makes these huge figures, and one of which was a seven foot seven. I mean, I want to say it was to scale. It was looming. It towered like one would assume that Yao Ming's actual height would tower, and it was sitting in his front yard. So I pulled over and trespassed and took a couple of photos. Well, I mean... No spoilers, but it's not like a grotesque depiction of him. I mean, it's not like, it's not a friendly image, but it also isn't like mocking him. So it really confused me. Uh, like, why, why not Michael Jordan? Like, why Yao Ming? It may have just been that he had seven foot six inches worth of iron <laughs> to sculpt. The, the, He's the like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an inch short of Sean Bradley. I've got four too many inches for... Keith Van Horn. This could either be Ivan Drago, Kuseps Porzingis, uh, the Bad Boy, uh, the Bad Boy Club logo, or Yao Ming. <laughs> <laughs> Yao, it is. <laughs> it is Yao. But it gets me to another show that I watched this this weekend. Big stuff. Uh, the Amazing Jonathan documentary on on Hulu. It was pretty incredible. You remember that comedian, the Amazing Jonathan, who had like props. He did like comedy magic. So he would get no. up there with, like, cards. He was, like, a big deal. Like, I remember loving him as a kid. Anyway, this documentary is incredible. It's just really incredible. It kind of veers into, like, an annoyingly emotional angle of the the docu- documentary maker, which I usually love, but I just did not want him to get in the way of the amazing revelation, like, 40 minutes into this, or half an hour into this doc. No spoilers, but... It's a must watch and it kind of like turns your head on the whole thing of like what I was talking about, like the evolution of the changing of something like comedy. And of course, I relate everything back to the NBA because the interns need content. And like this is definitely relevant to the way we see like things change in a game. And if comedians have a set of rules, then every time it changes, there's going to be a certain kind of reaction, right? 
I suppose. I still don't really know who this amazing Jonathan thing is. Um, are you being funneled towards these via, like, the algo? No, this one is, like, front page uh, Hulu stuff. It made a big... It was a big deal at Sundance. Um, an odd thing happens that's really cool in this documentary. So there was, like, a kind of a bidding war, I think, for this movie. So I had heard about this a long time ago. So I, I searched it out a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm wishing Ridelli was here because of his content digestion. I, I feel like you guys could have... <laughs> talked about this in a conversation that would have been far more interesting than me just listening to you. I think his reaction, if I could paraphrase our <laughs> good teammate, Jordan Ridelli, who maybe doesn't want it as much in the summer only. He's a De'Aaron Fox of cookies. Yeah, I, I wonder, like, does he have the killer instinct in summer to, like, add 15 pounds of muscle to acquire a corner three ball? Does yeah. he... Does he want it enough? I'm not sure his bias is crouch anymore. I think he's just like, it's a hot dog bias, man. Um, yeah, I think he would say, if I could channel his point of view, <laughs> I would say, I loved it. And he was like, nah, I don't think it's that good. And then we'd argue about it. But uh, I feel like you've captured um, the Rodelli take there. <laughs> Wasn't into it. Not so much. Like, Jordan, can you tell us more? It's like, that's all you need to know. <laughs> for now stay tuned for another Ridelli take we love you Jordan um, well the reason I brought up the YouTube algorithms is because mine are in absolute shambles these days why would you do well, I'm starting are you trying to, think... to trick it no I think it... alright so my love of Steve 1989 and MRE Unboxing and eating videos has been well discussed on the Cookies Basketball Podcast, the best basketball podcast. There's only one. So I've, I've been forced down a, a route of MRE reviews, so I'm getting those. <laughs> For some reason, I started looking at like little, I think because of the cat skills, I started getting like little houses, which seemingly segued into living in vans. I love that genre. Like, like little tricked out trucks. So I'm getting really hit hard by a barrage of MRE videos and living in a van. Am I going to join the military? Is that, are they trying to get me in the military? Because they're trying to get you acquainted with tricked out tiny houses? Yeah, they're trying to get me eating MREs and <laughs> living in a vehicle. That would kind of be the opposite of army motivation, right? Being like, Steve, Steve 1989 is like the opposite of recruitment. Is he not? I don't know. It's, it's really the normalization. Now I think it's totally acceptable to... Wait, is it your... 1989? Did I have the right year? Yes. Okay. Now I think it's fully acceptable to get your sustenance from a bunch of plastic bags full of gruel and I think it's acceptable to live in a tiny little vehicle. I'm either becoming an intern, being <laughs> groomed for the military, or perhaps being indoctrinated into a grim future in which we are all these little caged humanoids eating boxed, I don't know, boxed junk <laughs> and living in tiny capsules. I, whatever I'm, whatever's happening here is grim and it bodes poorly for the future of humanity, and especially myself, is all I'm saying. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rain down a contrarian take here, which is like my standard positive black mirror take. Like, what if it's actually helping you? What if it's just like, mm, appreciate the place you live, but if you do live in a small place, appreciate that. Like, as we're finding out, like, all of these, the, all the, the data points of, like, information people are gathering oh. on us. What if it's like not bad? That's my question. What if it's the opposite of the invasion? Okay, what if it's this? What if it's preparing me or mm -hmm. making like my this. life in New York City more positive because I live in a small place and say eat things out of cardboard boxes. <laughs> it's like it's like this is a fully acceptable way to live. Don't wait in line for the new fangled 
dish, the delightful dish, just like rummage through your cupboards like a like someone who was in a zombie movie. By the way, um, this is a point of personal pride. I'm going to boast about it and try to be an inspirational role model to all of you listeners. I've As now gone approximately four months without ordering anything from Seamless or Grubhub or Caviar or any of those things. Okay. I've seen you tweet about this. Uh, why? Because they're unethical. And this is an ethical podcast, Quo, as much as you hate to admit it. <laughs> the best ethical podcast. <laughs> is the most ethical basketball <laughs> podcast out there. Wait, so... Uh, most are deeply unethical. Come on. Stop, stop bobbing and weaving. Tell me why. Why don't I use Seamless or Why is it unethical? Try caviar? Because they're, they're terrible. They're terrible. I'm sick of the fucking middleman economy, Quo. I'm, it is garbage. <laughs> Amazon is the most powerful, most wealthy, taking over the universe off of being a middleman. Are it's we trash. not middlemen, though? No. Like, these are our takes. <laughs> okay. We, we, are Doesn't make the take, we are the take industry, and we are delivering them to the people straight from the take source, the take minds. Got you. Got you. Wouldn't the middleman be somebody who orders the caviar and then eats the caviar, and then you're stuck with the MREs? No, that doesn't work. But no, uh, no. But, okay, I'm so, sick of the middleman. I'm. Uh, it's everything, dude. The middleman economy is trashing the universe. Well, just the world. <laughs> I'm sick of the middleman economy. So, not shockingly, I am not that angry at middlemen because I love middlemen. <laughs> well, <laughs> we. We probably are more middle many than we realize. Like You're everybody, Elton Brandy, and of your in your love for the man in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I would almost offer this trippy, spaced out take. Oh, go off! <laughs> that players themselves are middlemen, right? Get out of here! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you. Would, I'm the one bobbing and weaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, if you pick, like, caviar... I'm, I don't even have caviar accounts because we live in New York and you just go and get your food. Like, I'm not far away from the things I want. I also live in Manhattan, so I don't I'm know what I'm not arguing food. that people shouldn't order delivery. I'm saying just don't go through the, the caviar portal because you don't want to, like, you know, because they have your credit card information and it's easier and you don't have cash on you. I'm saying grow up. Uh, grow uh, up. Do not give t- caviar or seamless or whatever... Of like a third of the money Would because you, you are, are, are too lazy to have cash on you or you're too, what, fearful or, or lazy to give your credit card information to a restaurant. I'm, Did you like delete places, your Amazon account? See, I, I still have it and I, I'm... <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm with you. I, look, yeah. I mean, I'm always willing to acknowledge my own hypocrisy. That's one of the last things. I really am trying to get rid of these things. I yeah, do not, no, do for not sure. like the middleman economy. For sure, and like I try not to use Amazon. Um, Same, and like fuck Airbnb, all these, and I agree. I but, use Airbnb, but also fuck it. Hey, okay, so a, a common criticism for some something that Andrew Yang has pointed out, being like, and this is a criticism I don't agree with, but it's like if we tax Amazon, don't people work at Amazon, and doesn't that affect real people? So if you if we don't use Resi and Resi goes out of business, aren't real people involved? Like when we boycott something like Walmart or McDonald's or like that was like the 90s thing, like big chain places, right? Like don't shop at Walmart, shop at the mom and pop. But then real people work at Walmart. So how do you parse that? Well, I think one example, and it was from Rochester, was in uh, Kodak. Eastman Kodak, the film company and, and camera company, was a, there was a book actually written about this, and they used that as a case example of this massive company that was the leading industry in Rochester, and growing up, it was like, you know, most kids I knew, or a huge percentage of kids I knew, their parents worked there, and most of them ended up getting laid off as they got older, and eventually, all of them did, and that was because Eastman Kodak could not survive or survived, uh, did not understand how to survive in the digital photo realm. And they compared that to like Instagram and Instagram having like 12 employees or something like that. So I think when we talk about like, well, what about the company of Resi? Resi probably doesn't have a massive amount of employees, but like, I'm not worried about hurting the middlemen economy though. Like they can go do something else. 
You know is what I'm it, saying? Like it's like. But this is less theoretical and more economical. You're talking about a uh, money wealth distribution, not the service. Like middlemen are crucial in this world, right? Like there has to be truck drivers to get. Uh, vegetables to us. There has to be someone who sets up a farm stand in Union Square in order to get these vegetables. We can't go. Yeah, to but, but a you could farm, also right? argue that those are those are tactile. And I know this is like a Ooh, that's, boomer a, that's a way. slippery still. Of yeah. course, of course, of course. I'm just saying, the whole disruptive portal of like, hey, we're gonna come in here and, you know, basically be a leech from both sides. We'll take money from the consumer. We'll take a slice. From the other side, we'll connect them together. Sit back and just like that. O- that business model is only based on being predatory. And I know that sounds like wildly hyperbolic, but it's true, right? It's like Airbnb's only business model is being predatory on both sides. They take a cut from you. They take a cut from on the other on um, from the person um, renting out their place. And their o- business model is only doing this more or taking in more money. There's no actual product here. But this is and, not and that's how I feel about like seamless. Like seamless, their ads on the subways are like, We're delivering your dinner. Like, no, you're not, man. You don't have your own delivery men, as far as I know. You just take a cut and you have but a portal. This economic behavior is not exclusive to middlemen though. Like I remember when seven eleven tried to descend upon New York City and they just set up locations next to bodegas. And oddly enough, like Somehow I talked to somebody who does this for a living. Like all she does is not all she does. She she's really powerful and her her company is set up locations for corporations. And she doesn't like it, but she's just like, you know, uh something like Walmart will come to her or seven eleven and be like, So we have this amount of money to spend on real estate. Where should we locate? And she looks at numbers, she looks at traffic, she looks at like market value, and she identifies the correct places to, you know, drop a, a Shake Shack. And I think you're talking about an economic practice that predates technology, like Resi or Seamless or anything like that. You're talking about like a service that someone has cornered. And this goes back to like <laughs> forever, I'm sure. It's just like, hey, uh, you have kids and you – like, oh, I'm talking about, like, pre-agricultural whatever. It's like, uh, I went out and got and killed this bo- wild boar. You didn't. Uh, so I'm going to parse this out and make you pay for it. And it's just like, well, did you actually, were you the ones killing the boar? Because I just want to pay that person. It's like, no, that person's out killing more boars, but I'm here selling you this thing. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not talking about the middleman over the course of history as being you know, a a devious figure necessarily. Because as you said, a truck driver, there's someone taking it from point A to point B and like that needed to happen. I'm really talking about in this current environment, I feel like everyone for the most part who's really thriving is part of this middleman economy. And it's these tech companies are really based on that, just being this connective tissue that's, as I said, the business model is pulling from both sides. And that's kind of why I respect like Apple, because I'm like, well, you Whoa. at least make no. It's like Ooh. at least at least you make computers, at least you make watches, at least you do things. But is a service not an actual thing? I don't know. It, it's it tough is. to say. It is actually right. Like uh, it, it, some of these companies, like Google, has like it's been really trepidous about getting into the hardware game, and they decided to do it. But it was kind of a debate internally for a while. But a lot of these companies, like we talk about tech, like right now, as if everything's working, like. We're finding out the the self correcting principle of money, like Uber is not a success. Um, it, its IPO kind of is struggling. Um, uh, Lyft is not quite working publicly. Um, there's laws that have really changed Airbnb. I mean, U- Uber Uber is absolutely another, and, and Lyft are absolutely middlemen companies. Yeah. I mean, they do provide a service, and it's a portal, and it's a connection. But look, uh, this is also coming from someone who works in media and largely in print media. And if you want to look at how the middleman industry demolished journalism, and it's pretty easy because all the ad revenue goes to Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Those isn't, are the three. And isn't it just more goes there. observable now? Like this has been ha- like, this is how Coke got big, right? Like the Coke brothers. And they were just like 
kind of silent for decades. And then finally everyone's like, wait a second. You're the guys not making drywall, but you're the guys making the money off of drywall in every house. You know, like, who makes this paint? It's like, well, someone makes a paint, but then the Koch brothers bought it and now sell it to you. Like, is this yes, not yes. just I, like I, a, I, an evolution I, of, like, people who understand economy? For sure. For sure. It's more that the scale to me today is... Observable, right? Is, is really observable and enormous when we look at the and stuff branding. we're using, when we're you know, on a daily basis and you're, and you're coming out of a journalism's background and being like, wait a minute, all that ad money? Well, everyone's like, it's a dying industry. No, the money's still there. It's just all going to companies that serve as portals between information and people without even really creating it. I mean, Twitter, it's just a portal. Oh my God, they don't create any, they don't, they don't create any fucking content. We're on it all day. Just like working away like little monkeys throwing our, idiotic musings into this gaping maw that then profits off of it. And you're like, wait, how is this even possible? Well, it's like when Vine went under, right? Like uh, these, these sites are designed well enough where most of us, like myself, don't realize like sometimes that I'm on a privately owned website that I agreed to their terms of. And when Vine went under, it was really sad because we lost so much, I mean, for lack of a better word, artwork, right? Like people had made these amazing videos that had gone viral and been seen by billions of people and that are just like gone into the ether that belong to Vine. And it was a sad moment where we realized it's like, oh, we've been like, okay, so this is a weird uh, example. Um, so uh, a furniture company decided to put a couple tables in a dive bar that I go to a lot. And they're a high-end furniture company, and they made these beautiful wooden tables clean, and they put them in this bar that was kind of like a messy bar, you know, with, like, graffiti and stuff. And through the course of a summer, people had, like, tagged it up completely, like, put pins in it, drawn, like, portraits of each other, put, like, famous people, famous taggers came through and tagged it. And then after the summer, they hauled it off and sold it for like thousands of dollars. And the people who were in the bar were like, well, that was our table. We thought this was like part of this place. And it's just like, oh, no, this was like this was put here for you to like accept it. And then it was taken away and recontextualized into a different market, you know. So th this is I, I just kind of want to clarify my like players as middlemen thing because I think that's like a, an idea I, I kind of think about often. It's like, of course, the players are being, what matters. Wait, being that this is an NBA podcast, <laughs> right. the, the best NBA <laughs> podcast, and not and not uh, Red Scare boys. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, but like sometimes I think about it especially during the off season when I can't watch actual games. And like, I know me and you kind of like have joked about simulation and all that. And I wish it was like a clearer word for it, but like these players are great and we should, they are what I think about when I think of the NBA, which started in 1996. But when I say they're middlemen, it's just like, I'm getting a little too stony. I'm saying like my memories and my experience are the only thing that matter in this world because I'm not sure any of it's real, whatever, et cetera, Area 51. So when I watch these games that I'm so much emotional investment in, sometimes I see these players as like a connection from A to B, which is like my desire to my actual feeling, right? So when I watch the finals and I'm like, I think Draymond Green is one of my favorite defenders of all time. And he goes out and performs like one of my favorite defenders of all time. He's a middleman for my experience. Yeah, this is insane. It's weird, but like, <laughs> that's what I mean. I'm not saying like they're pawns of a system. I'm just saying uh, through the lens of a fan and through the lens of a stony fan uh, would be like, are these guys just playing out something that's been pre-written in my brain already? Okay. And all I'm doing um, is confirming or not confirming it. That's where I was going with it. Stony. Well, I guess in that way, you could talk about it in the simulation of, say, 2K, where, mm -hmm. like, I want to watch basketball. I want to play basketball. This digital rendition of a player is a surrogate for those two kind of emotions. However, in the situation of real basketball, we're talking about actual human beings. Who are one hundred percent, and who are who are the product? 
but we frame them so poorly, right? Like, I don't, that's where I'm getting. It's like when you take a player as divisive as Ben Simmons, it's not about the player anymore. It's about your framing of him, right? So, well, like, right, right. So, but we can also s- try to separate the player from the narrative. Like, the guy is the guy. The narrative is what's generated, emanated but by him, and then and created by others. But to there's no separation, him in like an aura. I mean, there's no separation. That's what I mean by like this idea of them, this middle idea of them, because like. Ben Simmons is just someone who's really divisive. So when he has a good game, it's going to be perceived in predictable ways. Uh, but when somebody like Jamal Murray, who is like equatable to him in terms of like monetary value, in terms of contracts they got this summer, he doesn't get that. This is the Gordon Hayward versus Kyrie Irving debate, right? Like Kyrie Irving is the product of his framing that we put on him, and so is Gordon Hayward. I can see where you're going with this um, <laughs> Thanks, madness. Man. But it's interesting because there was an article in the Sunday New York Times about how NBA players were um, seizing more power and, and redefining, I guess, how the, the player was viewed and operated in the ecosystem of professional basketball. And... The, the timing for that article was intentional because it went along with the 16-19 uh, package in New York Times Magazine, which kind of talked about how slavery informs all these different elements of contemporary American life and how you can trace the roots to our incarceration rates, our disparity of wealth, um, even the layout of, of cities like Atlanta and, and, and traffic, how these all have their roots in this you know, cruel inequality that was, I guess, baked into sort of the American pie. And it's really well done, and I think it did a successful job explaining why the idea of American exceptionalism is far more poignant than it's typically used in saying, like, we're the ones who believe in freedom and top gun. It's like, wait, why do we have these problems with incarceration and gun violence? And um, why are we among, like, you know, the least... Why, why do we have, no like, very few labor rights? Why are we have so many people in poverty? And this successfully did that. And this made me think about the LeBron James and, and Rich Paul and Anthony Davis... And I thought, like, maybe we're not looking at this quite right. Maybe we're not looking at player autonomy in the right scale. We're saying, oh, yeah, about time, you know. The, the, it's a sea change, and players are now able to do this. Maybe we're not seeing this for what it is, and that it's actually far more important than just, you know, LeBron gets to pick his teammates. Yeah, and this comes off like No Simbin, the the NFL hiring Jay Z to kind of represent uh, the Ed, uh, no the the Kaepernick's uh, the movement that's been happening in the in the NFL, and there was a lot of controversy about them about them hiring uh, someone to do that, and Eric Reed, someone who's taken a knee during a lot of anthems, um, was kind of pushing back against the idea of a corporation bringing in someone like Jay to talk about, I call them Jay, like someone from the 90s, Jay-Z. Hove? <laughs> Hove. Uh, and like, and you're right, like, I, 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 I'm willing to do this, like, this is the debate we have with, like, advanced metrics, me and you. It's like, I don't know where to begin and end with, like, skepticism. And, uh, you know, we talked about player representation and autonomy for a long time, but I'm always willing to be skeptical of our own take and be like, let's redefine it, let's update it. And I like the idea of reframing this entire thing that we've, we've been talking about for a long time, which is like the LeBron James, the, the power to the player kind of thing, the, um, the interaction between Rich Paul and management. Um, how do you think we've been looking at it wrong? Well, what, as I said, what the, the 1619 project does is draw distinct lines between slavery 
and what we see today. And by that same, I guess, by that same route, we can say, well, is the reason that the NBA exists in the way that it does, where you have all these like owners who are white and billionaires and athletes who are Shout this, out to the Nets. This, this pool of talent that has created the league and, and led to it blooming in success and international popularity, the vast majority of superstars of whom have been black American men, is this emblematic of slavery? Is this emblematic of historical cruelty and injustice? And you can look at it and be like, yeah, probably. Like, I, yeah, it is. The okay. reason that the NBA is the way that it is and the reason that the players are who they are and the owners are who they are ties directly back to the way that America was created. And I'm like, mm, probably. Yeah, I mean, that's the sad thing about that amazing project that the New York Times did is like there's a straight line to all this stuff. And it's not to say like the NBA is doing a bad job at it. It's just like, it's cultural, right? And like every time something that thorough describes something cultural that we may not be like talking about enough, it's like humbling. And like, yeah, it's, I guess they're right. It's a straight it's like, line. It's like, fuck the owners, burn it down. LeBron, take over the league. Like, it, it, it needs to happen. And oh, we're down for I mean, Cookies is down for that. I mean, no, right. I'm not saying this is a change in our world at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, but hell yeah. Hell yeah. Instead of this quibbling by, oh, well, does LeBron have too much power? No, he doesn't have enough. Yeah. He's the greatest basketball player in the history of the universe. He does not have enough power. He, he should have more power than every owner combined. Who should have more power than him? Adam fucking Silver? Adam Silver, can he even touch net? Dude, like... Uh, can he clap glass? How, how low god. can he crouch? You know what I mean? The, yeah. Can the guy pull off a sham god into a hezzy jimbo? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny that we quibble about, like, millions of dollars and, like, how the Lakers and Anthony Davis and LeBron James don't have enough money to put together a competitive team because of a salary cap that was agreed upon. Meanwhile, Prokhorov, and I don't really know the numbers, but I think he doubled his money (laughs) in owning the Nets, and he made one of the worst trades that he ended up winning in NBA history. But at the time... And I would guess that doubling it is being modest. Yeah, he overpaid probably, and at this point, he would probably get well more. I'm just, I'm just estimating. I'm just like Joseph Sai bought it for like two point four or something. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think Prokhorov, like he was going to be, he will be ushered out as like a colorful buffoon in the NBA, and he just made like a billion dollars <laughs> off of a buying and selling of something that he used as a toy. And then we're just like, I mean, this is what happens. This is what market is like. Well, look at, look value at the Sixers. There. Look at the Sixers. They right. are going to make so much money whenever they inevitably sell that franchise. Oh my God. It's the most profitable thing. And, and not to get too carried away into this because like, I'm like, let's not be dummies about this. And like the, the economy in the world kind of like benefits some people like this. So I don't even want to like isolate NBA owners for it because like just one Google search and it's appalling, you know, and it's, it's shocking, but I think the wealth distribution in the NBA is messed up. The cookies ethos is like, no salary cap, free agency is good, player control, Burn no draft. Down. Yeah, yeah, we want all these things. Like, Zion Williamson should be able to sign for $400 million to the team of his choice immediately out of not even going to college, right? Like, that's where I stand on it. He's probably worth half a billion dollars. Yeah, again, I, this is always what we've um, tried to push via our, our propaganda that we're pumping into the <laughs> That's right. eardrums of the, the youth of America. and Oh, yeah, young people listen to this. The, the That's kids. Right. It's the kids who are really <laughs> trying to touch here. <laughs> uh, not, um, any, <laughs> not, not diggable planets fans? Uh, you know, it's the, the kids today who are listening to boot camp click, you know, and, and they want to hear Dilated Buckshot peoples. Shorty. But anyway, all that to say, moving on, but the 1619 thing, I thought, drew a parallel to the 
fundamental injustices that founded this country that are, are pretty apparent in professional sports today. That was all I meant when I said maybe we're viewing this out of the full context and only in the relative militancy that we typically subscribe to. And you're right to bring it up because this is a take that um, is important in like enjoying sports, right? Understanding all these these stories and how how we got here. And of course, this has everything to do with living in America. But like, sports is like a a nice way to do it, where like there's not as much actual suffering, <laughs> you know, where it's just like. We we have to take care of the players that like we think are unfairly framed, and that's just what sports debate is, right? Like, well, and this is this is a, a, a nice uh, transition moment here to talk about the Lakers and specifically Boogie Cousins because he's a guy who had a lot of these narratives that were put around him that he was a malcontent or that he was lazy that he couldn't do all these things. And then he ended up changing all those. And he became this beautiful modern player where he kind of altered the way that he looked and played on the basketball court, which in turn changed the narrative around him. That Boogie Cousins was someone who could, he became a big man who could shoot threes and he could run the pick and roll as the ball handler. And he was a good teammate and all these things And it never really got to the point in the arc where there was the validation, though, because he blew out his Achilles before his huge payday. And he became a tragic figure. And a few days ago, it turns out that he has a blown ACL. And this is back-to-back grievous injuries for a player who was sort of on the cusp becoming an absolute superstar who is beloved, who had all these skills in the modern game. And now he's like an afterthought, but also like a really sad story. And, and I agree. And it immediately made me think of Brandon Roy and uh, Lamar, uh, uh, Greg Oden, who were primed to be stars in this league. And at least Boogie got the respect. Like when Boogie went down with that ACL... Like, we, we kind of mourned it on Twitter, you know? And I talked to people in real life, and they're like, that's just really sad. I'm like, shout out to Boogie, who, like, got into our collective subconscious so much after just one year in Golden State and a, in a pretty lengthy time in Sacramento. Like, he is someone we deeply care about as a fan base. And, and, and you never even see these things coming, right? Because in his career, he played 81 games, 64, 75, 71 59, 65, 72, he wasn't an Iron Man, but he was playing, you know? He, he didn't have these, like, horrible injuries. And all of a sudden, it's like, this is now the story of him, the guy who was felled by an Achilles, ACL. You know, by the time he actually comes back, maybe he'll be 30 years old. And this is, that's kind of it. And let's talk about, like, what he represents to us as a fan base, right? Like, he is... The, the Rashid Wallace too, more Sheed, right? Like he kind of uh, represented what you've been talking about this whole pod is like this management versus player kind of dynamic, this middleman versus primary source dynamic, right? And people wanted to frame him as just like a bad dude, so many technicals, hothead, um, disagrees with his coach all the time. But through the course of his time in Sacramento even, we got to know him a little bit, and we're like, oh, none of this is true. Everyone loves him. Yeah, that was it. That was it, right? Because we were taught, we were told repeatedly by the punditry that Boogie's bad. He's a loser. He's unhappy. He's a hothead. He's got attitude problems. Fighting with his coach. Show me the wins. And ultimately, it was so clearly untrue that he was... Because he wanted it more? That he was... He was upset. (laughs) He was basketball geniusy. He was a wonderful, wonderful basketball player and an incredibly charismatic guy who seemingly was beloved by his teammates, by all accounts, and we were told that he was like a jerk (laughs) and he was like a loser. And that's where, like, the empowerment of the fan base came through, which is, like, we kind of, like, we're like, nah, that's not the story, you know, like... From what we're observing, like, he seems awesome. And him arguing about a call or 
uh, uh, barking at his coach was literally about what boomers <laughs> wanted, like him wanting it more, being like, I can't believe we're losing. I think you're doing the wrong thing. You should be m- using me here and not there. Or like getting called for a tech, just being like, dude, I'm trying to will my team to win just based off of my like emotion, you know? Right, and it comes down to what is the fan base and what are the voices who define you know, how we characterize players and teams. What are they comfortable seeing? Yeah, and he's, yes. They were uncomfortable seeing Boogie Cousins heated and going after a coach or going after a rep. That He's a bad guy. He's unsportsmanlike. He's all these things. But it's cool when it's John McEnroe. Right. Yes. Ooh, oh, that's tough territory. But, like, I think, yeah, what we're talking about is, like, gravity for, like, an object, right? And this goes back to the whole, like, the stand-up comedy thing I just watched. He's just like, oh, this is just a square cut out of plastic, but this means something. And let me tell you the story about this square. Um, And that's what certain players like Ben Simmons and Boogie Cousins have that other players don't. And you can't even tell me about market size because Boogie played in Sacramento and we cared so much about him. But we don't really care about Jamal Murray. And not many people care about Nikola Jokic, you know? Um, I don't know what defines this gravity or what creates it, but you can identify players with it. Like Zion Williamson has as much gravity as any player I've ever seen in my life. I like the idea of gravity being used both in a spatial and um, emotional way, quantifiable way, as well as it being the gravity of a a personality and what sort of depth and, and magnetism that certain players have. And it's interesting, we talked about this actually, but you know, is J.R. Smith having trouble finding a team because he's J.R. Smith versus being someone with his person, with his skill set who is available? And, you know, that's been mentioned about Carmelo. Is he being blackballed? And I don't think Carmelo Anthony is being blackballed. I think he's an old player who can't defend and is not particularly efficient anymore and was never a complete dead-eye shooter. And it's hard to find a spot for that guy in the NBA. I mean, but, it, yes. But... Is he better right now than Jared Dudley? Like, I don't know. I, I could not tell you. What's going on with Marquise Chris? How come the Lakers are looking at players like Mo Spates, Dwight Howard, who I think is great, but compromised because of injury? How come Marquise Chris doesn't have a team? That, that's what I mean. Is, is the gravity that we're talking about, is it anti-gravity? 100%. And, like, and that, that's how narratives get a hold of us. And, like... This is my original point that I'm having trouble like fleshing out, which is like we're not actually looking at empirical information. Like you're right, Melo is better than Jared Dudley, <laughs> but like we're looking at framing. Maybe, maybe right? Like maybe. I don't even know. Maybe. Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, probably. I mean, it it makes sense that he would be better, but maybe if the role is just to like play a little defense, pass the ball, and shoot right. an occasional three, maybe. I don't know. That's, and that's this is, the dynamic that's, that's and this is the boomers fascinating and, and also fun. Is like, <laughs> yeah. This is, is the Mello boomers better? lament, right? Give, right? It is, because like, well, Melo will give you buckets. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's will he, though? It's like, are you telling me you're into the eye test now? You know? Um, but it, it, it's the framework. Like, when, when I see Greg Oden play in the big three, they talk about him as like, this idea that we've made up in our head and it can come from multiple angles, but usually it's just like, Oh, this guy could have been so great. Like maybe probably, but like, why are we doing this to this guy? Like just let him be actually what he is. I thought it was pretty funny. Speaking of Greg's and basketball, was that they uh, asked Popovich about plus minus. And that was funny. he was like, he was like, yeah, I don't even look at it. And you saw like the eruption from like the eye test community like, they loved it. They were just, like, celebrating, took a victory parade. Like, Popovich doesn't like stats. It's a, yeah, yeah, he hates numbers. That's, that's the takeaway here. Like, they didn't even listen to what he said. It was like, this guy hates stats. And the part that was funny to me was uh, I saw Jamal Crawford, like, applauding it. I'm like, poor Jamal Crawford. Because, you know, he looks at his own numbers, right? And he looks at metrics or, or it gets mentioned. And 
he was like the worst player in the league by like RPM or BPM or PIPM, any cumulative statistical measurement. List him as like one of the five worst players in the NBA and seeing him out there like, yeah, yeah, I test, baby, stats suck. I'm like, hell yeah, I'd be saying the exact same thing if I was Jamal Crawford. I'd be like, numbers are a lie. It's all about heart and who wants it more. And I'm like, this is a guy who has played basketball his whole life that doesn't have a team and is being told that he's terrible at it. Like, of course he should hate stats. And, and he's right, but he shouldn't, I, right. <laughs> he shouldn't be in the, the barometer of this discussion, right? Because he's a participator of it. So he should think that he's one of the best players of all time. But us as fans, like, we can frame him, not in a cruel way, but just like, oh, yeah, he's different. And I think that's the beginning of, like, that's that's like the gateway idea for uh, the dark the dark web of, uh, of advanced metrics. It's like, what if scoring hurts you? Like, what if Jamal Crawford can get those buckets, but what if it leads to less wins? Like, what are you talking about? He's scoring. Isn't the job to score more points that's than the what other we're, team? That's what we're doing here. Yes. We're, and, we're, we're out here exchanging baskets. We're trying to outscore the other team. What do you mean? Right. Like, and, I thought D'Antoni taught us that, like, we're trying to score. Yeah, and that's what he's doing. Every time down the court, he gives you the chance at the most points. And we're like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't create a greater probability for a win. And you're like, well, what are you talking about? You know, and, and then as soon as you get into it, it's just like, oh, this thing is really complicated, but you don't pay Jamal Crawford that much money. But he stays in the league because he, this is dribble bias, right? Like, he looks like a player we call the best player of all time. He moves like a dancer. He's amazing to watch. He can cross anyone over, but you probably would do better with like a P.J. Tucker on your team. My, it's not probably. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. <laughs> P.J. Tucker, who doesn't even have the pedigree. Like, he, like, well, he was out of the league. P.J. Tucker is a fantastic modern basketball player. Jamal Crawford is a bad NBA player. But that doesn't mean Jamal Crawford is bad at basketball. It just means you have to know what you ha- you're acquiring him for. If you yeah. say, we want Jamal Crawford as our 11th man. Like, we can put him on the court sometimes when we just need someone to like get a bucket. Not even like you know, in a crucial situation. We just have him on the team. Like, he seems awesome. We want him in the locker room. We want him around guys. We'll give him some minutes in in games that don't matter. He can do a little spot relief if someone gets hurt. We just think Jamal Crawford's sick, and we just want him on the team. Yeah, That's um, what you get Jamal Crawford for in 2019. You just think he's cool to have around. Yeah, and he seems like the best dude ever. Like, if you just, like, read about him like he takes his games uh, he takes his kid to games like when he's not playing like nba games it's awesome but um yeah, it, he has his, his big tournament in seattle that's what i mean yeah. he like you you put him on the team like a amir johnson or a boban or a greg monroe you know like a guy that you would never put in <laughs> in a crucial moment of a uh, i don't know playoff series perhaps the eastern conference semifinal, something like that <laughs> And isn't it weird, like, you know, I'm going to stand for the Knicks right now. Like, you would think player, uh, teams like the Lakers and Knicks would have signed Jamal Crawford by now. Uh, they seem like the stereotypical uh, uh, target for these teams who kind of need anybody. And we've seen the evolution of the framework of someone like him and J.R. Smith now, where it's just like, oh, 10 years ago, yeah, someone would have taken a chance on Carmelo Anthony, but not anymore. And... And I wonder if it's like this is the actual influence of uh, metrics or it's just like these guys just aren't good anymore. Or well, Yeah, yeah. I wonder that. That's a good point, though, because Crawford's a perfect example. He doesn't have the baggage that JR has of being kind of a knucklehead and someone who, you know, partied too much and made brain freeze errors and would never be necessarily chosen as the embodiment of a veteran leadership. Crawford doesn't have that kind of baggage. We view Crawford as being a leader of being someone who's aged more gracefully. He's not someone who he seems coachable. Had, yeah. He hasn't had to like, you know, my quick recall any sort of on or off court incidents that anyone would, would question his ability to be a role model for younger players. And yet here we are. No one wants him. Yeah, and, like, this is, 
I, I wonder if Marquise Chris is sitting at home being like, why aren't the Lakers calling me? I know I'm not the perfect teammate. I know I've gotten to a fight with this person and that person, and I haven't been amazing, but like I am exactly who they want. Well, speaking of the Lakers, you know, you talked about a few of the candidates that they have. Um, I guess, you know, there's Dwight Howard. But to me, can they be a viable contender with Mozgov at center? Can we backtrack and just laugh at them for a second? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I mean, thank you. Oh, I'll backtrack even farther. Thank you for the Lakers and Rob Palenka and Jeannie Buss for giving us this amazing thing to talk about. I appreciate it. Like, it's is generous Roy, of them. Is Roy Hibbert <laughs> under contract as a player? There's could a, he could he coach for the Sixers D League affiliate while being the Lakers starting center? Player coach in different leagues. Legend Man, in two uh, games. You despise to see it. But like okay, so oh, God, Le- it's so toilsome to <laughs> lay eyes upon. Uh LeBron James goes to the Lakers for free. He just signs with them, right? Uh, no assets given, uh, except cap space. And then we knew that this whole AD thing was telegraphed for years. And they even gave months advance. AD came out, Rich Paul came out like, we're trying to get him to the Lakers. Palenka, Jeannie Buss know this. The whole NBA world knows this. It ends up happening in a vacuum. He's in gold and purple. And now they're looking at most spates as their savior. <laughs> Like, what happened, dudes? Like, you couldn't plan for this? Like, even the most casual fan might be like, oh, they're coming? Uh, no, don't no, give no. up we, too we, much. We, we got a, um, Boogie Cousins, the guy who <laughs> just came back from uh, an Achilles injury. He's going to be our starting center. I think we're fine with that. Guys, um, Dwight Howard. Okay, well, okay, okay. Uh, Ameka Okafor, I know he's around. Yeah. We could hit him up. Where, where's Luis Scola? <laughs> yeah. Where's Memento Core? <laughs> ah, Joel Prisbilla. Yeah. We, we are a contender again because Samuel D'Alembert is walking through that door. But imagine this scenario of Palenka being like, oh, man, I think Willie Hernan Gomez can help us. And he's expiring. <laughs> and he only costs $1.5 million. I'm going to call Jordan. Jordan, would you trade us Willie Hernan Gomez? Like, you don't have enough. It's wild. They don't have enough for any move. Moving forward indefinitely. Okay, can we put aside Mehmet Okur's politics? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like Frank Kaminsky. Ooh, he's a diamond in the rough. I bet we can get him for nothing. It's like, no, you guys don't even have draft picks left. It, like, they, they have no moves. And I don't, it's inexplicable how they painted themselves in this corner. And shout out to Dwight Howard, who's one of the greatest players ever. Like, we got to talk about him in the top 25, right? Where, yeah, but where is, like, Anderson Verizhao's agent in this? <laughs> I Lou mean, Edmondson's just out there, like, scratching his balls and can't, like, get a tryout? Does Luke Cornett fire his agent now, being like, yo, I could have been, been something, man, signed for, like, a couple million bucks? <laughs> but, like, what? so I'm going to ask you, like, all jokes aside, what went wrong in L.A.? Like, this team looks like it's rebuilding. With two stars. Look, I think if you can get Al I mean, Jefferson. That's hyperbolic, but. You can find a Jeff Foster. <laughs> maybe a Big Z, a Chris Kamen. I mean, there's a lot of options out Austin there. Austin Crozier. Andres Biedrins, if he can shore up his foul shooting. Marcus Camby. <laughs> the Camby man? <laughs> <laughs> Udonis, are you available? Oh, no. We don't, we don't have the assets. <laughs> <laughs> I love like the the constant moving of goalposts with this because when you talk to Lakers <laughs> fans, it's like we got it, baby. We got Kawhi coming. Okay, he's not coming, but we're gonna get Boogie Cousins. Oh, he was an MVP candidate, max player. We got him for nothing. Okay, he's hurt now. Ooh, Dwight Howard, man, he's gonna save us. <laughs> okay, okay, Chuck Hayes is undersized, but he's available. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Can we get Julius Randle back? No. Oh. Antoine Jameson, baby. <laughs> Uh, it it's wild and like and I don't blame the optimism from Lakers Nation because you got the sports car and we've talked about this endlessly like AD is in LA but what happened like all you need is Zubac back and then you're kind of cooking well that's the thing because we all agreed that yeah the Lakers had to kind of give up everything to get Anthony Davis 
that's yeah. because that that's the bed that they've made. Yeah. You have LeBron James, Anthony Davis wants to go there. That's two of the top five players that's on fine. the planet. That's like, fine. Okay, you have to give up what it takes because you have you have made this bed. You left yourself no other options, and you telegraphed it so Griffith knew what to do. Now, of course, they had other options. They didn't have to do any of that stuff. Yeah, I know, but it's like we're we're we can talk, like. We, they gave away we, Mo Wagner for space. <laughs> like, I mean, we, what we, are you doing? <laughs> for Mo Spates? <laughs> uh, Spates too. Mo Spates. <laughs> it's like the Bone Thugs affiliate. What are you going to call them? Uh, Mo Thugs? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Done. Classic. But the thing was, we all kind of gave them that... that uh, that, that out. We said, yep, you have to do it because they did. But they also put themselves in this position by trying to wheedle Anthony Davis and strong arm him away before the offseason. At some point, you have to say, no, Lakers, you did everything wrong. They made you had errors, Anthony man. Davis yeah. wanting to come there. You had LeBron James wanting to come there. You had all this space. You had all these decent young prospects, guys with value, and you got bullshit. And it's going to cost you a chance at a championship, most likely, because you fucked this up. It, and we, we see this with other teams. When you're not doing a good job, your opportunity narrows, and you really got to be right. And we saw that happen with Philly. They had the talent with Butler, with Tobias Harris, with Joel Embiid, with Ben Simmons, but they couldn't get the bench right. They didn't add guards. And the they got second unlucky. rounders that... Yeah, and they got unlucky, but I just mean, That's they still part. could have done it. But yeah, you, nar- you narrow your opportunities. If they had just had a reasonable backup center, if they just had a couple guards that they'd use, say, the second round picks that they ended up selling, if they'd use some of those, the deadline to pick up, you know, Shabazz Napier, the Sixers may have won a championship. And that was a narrow window. Now Jimmy Butler's gone. Your window is is even narrower still. And that's the deal with the Lakers. You have... Two wonderful top players in the history of the sport, but you might have fucked up everything along the way that prevents you or makes it really difficult to win a championship. You're right. The AD move, the LBJ move, those were gimmies. Make that happen. I'll, I'll swallow the package that they sent to New Orleans for AD because he is what he is. You could parse his aspiring contract, all these things, like whatever. It takes a lot to get him, as we saw with the uh, Paul George trade. It takes a lot to get these stars. But, the, right, the devil's in the details, right? Like, you gave away Zubats for nothing. A you, Mike Muscala rental. Like, what's a Muscala? Yeah, you gave away uh, Mo Wagner, a tradable asset if you don't even think he's going to be a good player. This goes back to D'Angelo Russell. You, you don't even have a Wagner, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's there's no reason why Anth- uh, Julius Randle should walk away f- for nothing. There's no reason why you have to package D'Angelo Russell, future All Star, just to get rid of a Mozgov contract. Why did you sign that Mozgov contract? Like, why did you so- sign Luel Deng? Yeah. So the Lakers, when Tatum was available. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trust the procedure. Oh, good times. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's going to be great this season, right? Because their success or failure will be framed around if AD wants it enough. <laughs> and it's just like, can you get him a Zubats? He told you he does not want to play the five. Can you get him any five? <laughs> nope. I mean, it's interesting because the, what we've seen with LeBron is that he works best with four out. Mm-hmm. You know, he can work with a pick and roll big, and Davis is a fantastic role man. But you're kind of saying that, like, I, are you better off with Davis as, as your five all the time and being like, uh, yeah, it sucks about Boogie and all, but Davis as the five is probably better. And not having a five to play with Davis, despite the fact that he wants to be a four, like, uh, apparently the Lakers might be better off not having another center and just forcing him to play that position. I agree, but, like, do you trust Palenka and Jeannie Buss to, like, adopt that kind of, like, revolutionary idea in terms of, like, 
you know, like no sin being like starting a relief pitcher in a baseball game. Like it takes a certain like mental fortitude to commit to that and take criticism because they're going to lose a bunch of games before they win a bunch of games. Well, we saw this. Right, right, right. Actually, that's a very good point because one thing that often gets forgotten is that every time there is massive turmoil on a team, they always lose off the bat. They struggle. It takes a little while to get that that rhythm, that continuity because the preseason's bullshit. Mm-hmm. And the first few games are bullshit. <laughs> but. Yeah, and but we see this all the time. We saw it happen with LeBron in Miami. Cleveland, LeBron yeah. in Miami. Even with Golden State, they struggled initially when Gar- uh, Durant got there. And I don't mean struggled, struggled because that talent was so overwhelming, but they didn't immediately get it, and then they yeah. did. Yeah, you don't so, hit the ground running. So to your point. If you don't have a lot of talent or, or great moving pieces around these guys and it doesn't work early on, what do the Lakers do? Are they actually similar to not having a center? Are they better off being handcuffed? They have no moves because they're – right. I mean if, if they really wanted to do the cookies thing, they would not have a center in the traditional sense. But they're – I think in their arsenal of – tricks they're just like do we start caruso or not you know it's just like do we put caruso in the starting lineup and i'm like that's not a really like seismic change that doesn't it's not effectual they don't have the the roster to make effectual moves no no not at all and look i think kuzma's already an interesting sort of nba character please go easy on them interns it's going to be a long season no but you know kuzma he might be good but he, he's in a weird position. He's someone who hasn't really done anything, but he's become a kind of a divisive guy where he's sort of a star because he's in L.A. and he scored a bit. And he's handsome. He, he has that whole Ben Simmons thing where it's like he's gallivanting on yachts with Kardashians. Yeah, yeah, and he, he dresses pretty street wary and He's a fun of, guy. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. He, it's to your point. He's got the gravity of, of, of being a character, but he's not really any good. He's but he's average. not really bad either, yeah. so he's right, kind of right. in a sweet spot where like, you can kind of project whatever you want on him. But he's going to get buckets because that's his strength, and people will probably frame him better than he actually is because he, he's a scorer who needs a little bit of volume, and he's going to get more efficient with these two geniuses on the court. But so far, he's been – he depreciated in his second year. He's already, I think, 24. Um, I, he might have a nice season, but we're going to – as a community, can be arguing about him all season. I do wonder what he is as a shooter. Guys generally improve, but there was a big drop-off his second year. He should elasticize back, though. I don't think that's a trend. I just it, don't it know. Could be. Yeah, we don't know. We have to see. I'm saying to, to go from being a, a 37% three-point shooter to a 30% three-point shooter, shooter turns you from a, an above-average threat to an absolute liability, considering that he took like 400 threes last year yeah the uh, the the lakers don't have that much spacing because the idea of lbj and anthony davis being true threats at the arc isn't real they don't shoot well enough from there well also you know with kuzma you're taking you're shooting three the same as joel Embiid from three and Joel Not Embiid doing a, all the Joel Embiid right, things. That's what I'm saying. Joel Embiid is a, is a stretch five. So yeah. when he shoots 30% on far less volume, at least you're trying to draw a center out of the paint. Oh, With easy. Kuzma, People are going to come at you for that sentence. <laughs> Making the defense as honest, Ben Dietrich. Oh, I'm just saying, in general, having your five away from the court has some advantages to it. Oh, no, a stretch is With, real. Yeah. With, with, someone like Kuzma who's out there with LeBron and out there with Anthony Davis and maybe a center, he's kind of your two or your three sort of from a, uh, you know, a spacing standpoint, he's kind of your key spacer. It's amazing. Is, I mean, I'm so grateful for this Lakers team. This is awesome. Cause if they're good, this is going to be super fun too. You know, like there's, at least through their bumbling ways, the Lakers organization has given us the reason to watch this season. I'm so excited to watch the Lakers. I mean, uh, it's going to be great. One other thing here uh, before we bid adieu. That's uh, French, um, you guys. 
Is that it's a, not a Paul Pierce what's reference? Up, what's up with everyone dropping like flies out of the Team USA basketball team this summer? It's like just that, uh, yeah. a couple of days ago. I think the latest defection was Sacramento Kings legend rising blooming star De'Aaron Fox, who said that he wanted to dedicate the summer to becoming a better player and helping the Kings reach the playoffs next season. And then he quit the team after I think playing like eight minutes or something in their in their uh, victory. He tweaked something over and Spain. Then, right. I mean, the boring answer would be we know we. Right after Demarcus Cousins gets injured, for example, we know that like playing meaningless games is a big problem and threat. Like anything can happen, so therefore, like do not put yourself in risk if it doesn't matter. And contracts are a big deal. So like these friendly games for I don't know, like relegated trophies. You know, like it just doesn't matter. And um, but the the flip side, which is more fun, is. I think De'Aaron Fox looks at the the cafeteria table, that meme, and just seems a bunch of Celtics, a bunch of procedure guys, and it's like, I don't want to hang out with these guys all summer. My summer is like, time is valuable, man. I want to hang mean, out with my friends. I mean, dude, it's a bunch of Celtic guys and Duke guys and the Venn diagram that connects them. You're like, yeah, I'm going to really roll with this squad. Yeah, and to bring it back to Boogie, Team USA, everyone talks about like, yo, we had the best time. Look Look at this video of me and DeMarcus Cousins hanging out. Like, it looked fun. Look at me and a Plumley. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> which one? We'll never know. I don't know. The one that sounded most like a bartender at Hotel Chantel. <laughs> uh, at Lemons. Mason, Miles. I don't know <laughs> yeah. which one. <laughs> but um, this team looks like no fun, man. Like, it looks like a bunch of dudes who want it more. I mean, Marcus Smart seems like some guy you could have fun with, but he's probably loyal to his guys, which is like Tatum and Jalen Brown. I don't know. It, it, like you look at your summer and you're like, the season's about to come up. I, Why well, bother? When I look when I look at that team and I see Kemba and I see Marcus Smart and I see Jason Tatum, I say that USA basketball is rebuilding <laughs> in shambles. But the what's interesting is that without putting on my Maoist shining path. <laughs> headgear again and going back down the political route (laughs) I'm wondering if USA Basketball fits under the same paradigm that we were describing with players having more autonomy because spending your summer working to get a gold medal is the ultimate like suckers game right? Suckers. Oh man so what you're getting at is like do you think in the back of Darren Fox's mind like he's just like this country is in a weird place right now especially for someone like me like a young man like me a businessman like him and he's just like I don't feel compelled to represent us in this way when my coach is like Coach K or Colangelo Uh, well now it's it's Pop who's awesome of course oh my bad my bad but there is again I may be reading too much into it but I'm I'm not sure we can say it's a coincidence that players are seemingly more reluctant to dedicate their summer without pay or without significant pay. I'm not sure if they get a stipend or whatever it is, but to be on a national team instead of taking time off or working on their game or just doing anything else, but to go out and say, okay, I'm going to rep the United States and play for free and give up my summer for a, Bobble for a glittery bobble in international play. Now, nah, fuck that. And Team USA has gone, it's cyclic, right? So there's a team that goes out there, underperforms, and then the stars get together and perform again. And then the stars get bored and underperform. And it, it, go, it flip flops like that from Olympics to Olympics. And I think what we're seeing, to your point, is like it's more of a trend than an acute thing. It may be not about like this administration's policies or the idea of American right now. It might be guys just being like, yo, a lot of my friends get hurt playing in these games that aren't NBA games. And like, I got a nice house. I got a family. I got my friends. I want to try that spicy 
Popeye's chicken sandwich, which was amazing. Like, I want my summer to be fun before I have to go back into work mode and, like, yes. play the and, whole, and I'm, you know. I'm saying it doesn't even need to be the cliche of, no, I'm going to work more on my game and lead the, you know, relegated Knicks to the playoffs next season and back into the NBA. It doesn't even need to be that. It's like, no, this is my time. I, I'd rather do something else. I'd rather sit on the couch and play Fortnite. I just yeah. don't feel like going and dedicating sweat equity into earning a medal in international basketball at a time when, yes, blowing out my knee would have a huge impact on me signing an extension after this season. Yeah, and but let's go down the rabbit hole of the thing that's harder to talk about, which is like national identity, right? Like what if players aren't as excited to play and represent our country as they were maybe back in the Cold War or when we had like a clear kind of like role in this world. Now our role is kind of like, it's complicated, right? Because like we're fighting amongst ourselves and uh, we're maybe overtly not acting as like better citizens in this global context, right? Well, you also tie that into the fact that America in terms of public policy has become really cruel and uh, towards immigrants and is vilifying them, as well as people of color, of course. But these guys are teammates now with a lot of international players. Yeah, these are their boys that they're playing against. <laughs> yeah, so it's like the, there isn't probably the jingoistic thing of like, let's kick the world's ass. We're right. like, well, we were, as a nation, oh, we want to go against... Joe and, and, and Ben and, and Dario and yeah. Porzingis. I just mean, these teams are heavily international now. Mm -hmm. There's not this American identity even in terms of the NBA. You look at the young stars in the league, Giannis, Simmons, Embiid, Porzingis. Jokic. They're, Jokic. They're, they're just not f from America. It's a wide swath of, of the globe. RJ Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> Say the name, Ben. <laughs> but yeah, there's not the there's not the same sort of oh, we got to prove to the world that no, no, we play with these guys all the time, man. We know them; they're sick. Yeah, we we, we all respect each other. We don't need to like go out there and and you know play Firefox <laughs> against the the guys from Eastern Europe. Yeah, and Firefox that was a great reference. I love that. <laughs> I was like, no one's going to remember that shit. <laughs> I love the genre of like vehicle dramas. <laughs> Just always against the Soviets? <laughs> yep. Why not? Um, but yeah, I mean, that narrative has kind of changed completely from the 80s. And, and Darren Fox or anyone who chooses not to play, the many superstars who choose not to play on Team USA, shout out to Carmelo Anthony who's waiting for that, waiting for his chance again. But uh yeah, you won't let that man play? He's, like, he's begging you. I don't know what we're doing. Like, we're punishing some people. Like, you know, not that Melo's anyone's... Argu he's arguably the greatest player in USA international basketball history. But maybe that's Arguably. What, maybe that's what superstars are looking at, or even a player like Darren Fox. It's like, Melo had dominated international ball, and look what you guys has done, have done to his legacy, you know? It's like and if you... I, yeah. I agree. And also, I have no idea if anyone cares about the fact that Jerry Colangelo donated thousands of dollars to Donald Trump after Trump attacked Steph Curry, LeBron James, NBA superstars. That's not something I would think was that cool. I mean, that's just me. I'm not speaking for any player or even that they care about this one iota. Mm. But the guy who's putting the team together donated money to the guy who attacked the superstars in the league. Like, I don't, I think that's a distraction in a way that Carmelo is not a distraction. Well, that's something that was unearthed by Twitter, but that didn't really gather steam because it immediately butts up against the heads of like, do we really want to look at like every team owners? Like, like Prokhorov, we kind of knew how he made his money, but didn't really want to talk about it. You know, like, absolutely. It gets complicated. Uh, yes, yes. And, by all means, we know that the average billionaire, regardless of what industry they're in or whether they own a team or not, is probably donating to Republicans because it has their interests at heart. 
I'm only saying that the guy running the USA basketball team deciding who makes it, I think it's an odd look to have that guy overt in his support of a politician who attacked the greatest basketball players in the country. Yeah. I, just think that's, I just think that's a weird look. I'm mostly surprised that he even did it. And like that's how malignant he is. He didn't care. He still donated thousands of dollars to the guy who attacked LeBron James and Steph Curry. And that's, we, that's fucked up. And can we talk about how funny these dollar sums are? It's like, oh, my God, Colangelo donated to Trump, and you're like, $2,000. You're like, huh? Shouldn't that read like $200,000? Like, these sums are so odd. Like, so-and-so donated money to this person that I don't agree with, and you look at it, it's like $607. But that's kind of what I'm saying, right, was that – it's not even enough to make this huge difference. So the fact that he did it is even more of a purely political. It's like, Oh no, I just want it to be like known that I support the guy who LeBron called a bum. I just, I just want to make that clear to anyone who puts my name into a campaign donation or to the box flip side of that flip side of that would be like, and I'm not defending him, but just the idea of that transaction would be like, Oh, I've known him for a long time. We've done business together. I can't not support him, but this small amount is kind of says everything. Right. I, I I agree. It's optics either way you look at it. I'm more. I'm not surprised by his politics. We know what they are. He's palling around with Jeff Sash, Jeff Sessions and and Dennis Hastert. Whatever his his Republican credos are well established. I'm just more surprised that he did this after the you know, the stars of the NBA clashed with him and with, like, international basketball coming up. I was just surprised that it did not seem to be a savvy move, but maybe it's just the fuck you of an old man towards everyone. And and saying, turning down Team USA in the summer of 2019 has, like, a pretty high upside, right? Because as soon as, like, certain key players say no, like, there's no incentive to play on the team. Uh, It seems like the four Celtics that are the four procedural players that are in on the team, like did it for camaraderie and they're like, I'll do it. If you do it, like we want to hang out with each other this summer anyway. So instead of a gym, let's, let's go, you know? Um, so and then, and then with um, Donovan Mitchell there, it's kind of a, a police procedural <laughs> police state <laughs> police procedural. <laughs> <laughs> Give me this moment. Come on. <laughs> Tatum, Smart, Mitchell, Police Procedural. I want to see some IDs. Um, wait, did you have the spicy chicken sandwich from Popeye's yet? No. I saw you praising it. Rembert said that it does not uh, he's, stack up. He's doing the, a uh, Jordan thing. So, like, oh, respect to Jordan and Rembert. But, like, sorry to cut you off as well. No, I'm no, just a no, mess. I, I, I'm just I, very passionate about this. No, go off, oh, King. <laughs> I, I was just chicken king. <laughs> so, chicken a la king. <laughs> so every, any viral controversial food item is attractive to me, especially when it's like easily gettable. Uh, so you know, like maybe a week and a half ago, this thing like took Twitter by storm. Everyone's like, yo, what, what the hell is this thing? It's the most delicious thing I've ever had. I will wait in line down the block for this thing. I love it. Here's videos. People are doing dance moves to it. It became like its own viral uh, presence on my Twitter feed. So I went out and had the sandwich. Of course, skepticism is my, I lead with skepticism. And I was like, yo, this thing is delicious and as good as everyone said it was. I want to join in the joy of my Twitter feed. And then enough time goes by where it incentivizes people to be like, not that good. I'm like, well, why not? It's like, I dropped the mic on that. And it's like, first of all, I hate that phrase. I can't believe I said it. But like, it incentivizes people to be like, I've had better. And I'm like, oh, we've gone through a cycle of consuming this idea already. Now, where did you locate a Popeye's Louisiana kitchen or whatever their uh, phraseology is? Uh, my studio, this is kind of dark. My studio is in Bushwick next to the hospital on Broadway and flushing and every single fast food um, franchise is represented there. Well, it's kind of a one-stop shop. It's wild like uh Little Caesars. Like even the ones you don't see that much are just like holding court and they're packed and I that's where I got my sandwich and it was as good as they said. Cuz I put it into Google Maps when I saw it was 
a subject of discussion, mm -hmm. and there's not one particularly close to me. I think. Yeah, but you in live in Brooklyn, a highfalutin neighborhood. Sure, sure. The the closest one to me was, I believe, the one on Broadway that you're referring to. Oh, that's the closest one. So, well, yeah. short of going into the city. Yeah, yeah. In Chinatown, there's one. Um, it. So it's interesting to me not only as a delicious food item, um, but also as like a phenomena of like something someone has to have a take on. So it's just like, so and so, what's your take on this sandwich? It's like, oh, I gotta go get it. And like food nerds, like food nerds have always been like. I mean, that's kind of why I googled it. I'm not even someone who necessarily jumps into those viral food crazes. Yeah. But I was like, if I if I'm near it, I might as well. Yeah. Pick up a chicken sandwich so I You're can... just living your life, man, as a relevant so can, human you know, being. I, so I can get in the game. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, like, for years, Popeye's was the thing that, like, chefs and, uh, like, fancy food people would be like, actually, that's a great restaurant. And people were just kind of rolling their eyes, being like, oh, you just want to be down. You just want to have that take, you know? It's just like, I can eat that stuff, too. And it's clearly better than, like, most fast food restaurants. I try not to eat that stuff anymore. It makes me feel terrible. But, like... Remember Stephen Tanner, the uh, oh, chef yeah. from Commodore. Pies El and Cortez, Thighs. Pies and Thighs. Shout out. I remember him telling me that his favorite restaurant was Checkers. Oh, that's right. He famously said Checkers. Yeah, yeah. He, he said it in an article, and people got mad at him. And then he was telling me that it was actually genuine, and he loved Checkers. Oh, for sure. If you've met Tanner, the, yeah. Yeah, that he loved the one on Broadway, which is in the direction of the Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen? Is it Louisiana Kitchen? What yeah, is it? yeah. I mean, I've never had Checkers or, like, Sonic or, I don't know. It's regional, but, like, I grew up around here, so I haven't had a lot of that stuff. But I know it's everywhere. Everywhere. But, like, uh, so I have blind spots. So I went into this thing being, like, I don't really have, like, agency here because I can't compare it to, like, another great sandwich. I only know the standard stuff, you know, like McDonald's and Wendy's and stuff. So I didn't really have a, a solid footing. Okay, Shake Shack chicken sandwich versus the Popeye sandwich. I've never had the Shake Shack chicken sandwich, although I love Shake Shack. Is it Shake good? Shake Shack chicken sandwich is, is good. I can't say that it's better than the Chick-fil-A because I've never really had them within a window of time when a mm. comparison would be a prudent or fair judgment. Yeah, and what's fair? Like, do you have to be kind of buzzed coming from the bar after or home after pounding 12 claws? Or can you just, like, I had it for lunch. Like, I just went and had it at, like, 12.30. Right, that's a good point. Does it have to be... Like, how many claws deep <laughs> does are you it, allowed to have it? And it's still... When does street meat judgment. start tasting good? How many claws in? Yeah, because, you know, what's the name of the spot on Houston, the, um, the, the, uh, the cab stand? Oh, the Halal Guys. The Halal Guys. Not Halal Guys, though. Oh. The one on Houston. The oh, one oh, um, the Indian spot, the famous yeah. one. Uh, uh, Punjabi. Uh, Punjabi, right. That yeah. place is legendary. Legendary, yeah. But I've never eaten there before four a.m. or two a.m. Yeah, I just don't know what it tastes like in the grim, bleak sobriety of day. Yeah, it destroys me, but it's delicious. But um, it's great. I just yeah. have never woken up and eaten it. It's like the Rochester's fabled garbage plate. Oh, that's right. You you come from the home of the garbage plate. How would you ever eat that sober? I don't know. Wait, tell our but, listeners what the garbage plate is. So the garbage plate is. I guess Rochester's only actual delicacy. 100%. And it's also not a delicacy. <laughs> uh, well, so what, what, makes it, what makes it unique is that you have hash browns on, on one side, and then you also have a macaroni salad on the mm. other, and that's your base. So you have something that's ostensibly hot and something that's ostensibly room temperature or to cold next to each other. Then you're going to put hamburger patties or split hot dogs on top, and mm -hmm. then there's, like, some gravy that's, like, kind of an oniony, uh, very sort of acid, vinegary-based sludge that goes on top. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of your product. Mm -hmm. So you've got this... You kind of swirl them together, and it becomes lukewarm, kind of potato-y, slaw-y sort of salad with meat on top. I know, and it sounds grisly. It sounds like it, that Hawaiian kind of thing, right? 
I mean, I mean totally independent. It's something that you just never Great would mind. eat unless you were obliterated off the claws. <laughs> the the long American tradition of pounding <laughs> a case of claws and going to get a junk like plate, the, the garbage claw- plate. <laughs> <laughs> the claws have really got to be into you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it got me thinking about uh, like the long tradition of sandwich controversy, right? Because like you can't step into Philly without arguing about like Pat's versus Geno's, and like I've had both. They're kind of I know I'm going to get in trouble, but they're kind of the same. Whatever depends on like. How good the bread is that day? You know, it's all negligible. But then there's a new sandwich in Philly that came out like a few decades ago, which is like the the Nick's roast pork broccoli rob oh, sandwich right. that people are like, that's the best sandwich. And I love this discussion, but I... but it, And it's all based on like the person that you sort of trusted that took you there. Yeah. I remember going there and someone's like, no, it's actually Ishka Bibbles. So someone yeah. asked me like, right. Ishka Bibbles is the best based right. on the fact that I went there because someone told me to. Yeah, yeah. And like Wawa sandwiches are a thing. Like people swear by those those like 7-Eleven deli sandwiches and they're fine. I haven't had one in like 30 years, but like I love this controversy and I always reside on the side of like, I can't rank any food. When someone's like, that's the best slice in New York. I'm like, I don't, I can't do anything with that except like tell me if it's craveable or not. If it's craveable, I'll try it because like it depends on who's making it. I've been burned by this because I was a staunch advocate of prosperity dumplings for many years and ate there a lot. It it was a, Which a small one? storefront dumpling on you, was Eldridge Hester. One? I want to say it was on Eldridge, yeah. Yeah, they had one so, on Clinton too. Yeah, this was an Eldridge one. So I went there a lot and I was always you know, boosting it up all the time. Oh, best dumplings, prosperity. It wasn't even based on having like any prosperity dumpling middleman. I was absolutely, and that's a, a bad place to be. <laughs> but I, I was always advocating for it. That doesn't even mean it was that good. It was just the one that I liked, and I told people to go there. And it was extremely cheap. And it was well whatever. loved, man. You weren't alone there. That was a right, good right. tip. Yeah, I, right. So then a video came out. <laughs> <laughs> Tread lightly there, <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> Talking to the king of uh, Dime Square here. <laughs> uh, a video came out that was taken from above by a neighbor. And in the, the back alley slash yard, like a small concrete patio is, is being uh, giving it a little more of a flourish than it should probably have. It's just a little, zone. a little area in the back, yeah. They were out there making the dumplings on like a folding table as rats ran around their legs. There and was a just... dead rat near, like within five feet of them. <laughs> it's crazy. Bro, Yo. Bro. I, want... I was just like, I've eaten there and I, I sent so many people to that place. But like also, okay, to your defense, that was a well, that was a well-loved dumpling during like the age of like that doughy with dumpling craze, like the dollar dumpling craze that Vanessa started. Yes, yes, it was exactly that. And so the, uh, Prosperity was a competitor, and I kind of liked them better than Vanessa's because they just seasoned everything better. They were better than Vanessa's. I agree. And that video was horrifying, but like the, my first thought it was like, yo, that's crazy. I'm not even going to frame this as like, yo, it's culturally different, you know, whatever. <laughs> They're not, I'm like, yo, that's a bit much, man. Um, <laughs> and But then I got to thinking like, what aren't we seeing with most restaurants, right? And like the sh- the stuff that people tell us on the internet, like Kitchen Confidential came out so long ago, rest in peace, Bourdain. But like he told us like the underbelly things of uh, restaurant culture that kind of like didn't really line up with what we thought we were paying for. And I saw that video. I'm like, oh, it's a shame that video came out or that that photo came out, but. Do you remember? I'm, I hope. I'm, I mean, I, I I didn't even take it as. Oh, I've been eating this disgusting thing. It was yeah. because I was naive. It was more the the plausible deniability of like I don't want to know what's happening back there. Yeah. You just come through the yard with your dumplings and you cook them up yes. and they're fine. Suspension of disbelief with food all the time and yes. eating meat all the time, which we discussed before. Like it's time for us to reframe that. But okay, so just to even the playing field to to support my people, it's like. A few hundred feet away from the restaurant you're talking about used to be this hangout called Brown, right? Uh, that, that cafe that served, like, nice French food and brunch. It was really popular. And a video went viral on Vine of someone walking by and seeing, I'm not even joking, maybe three dozen rats running roughshod over the whole place behind the gate. 
And it went obviously viral. And the brown people were like, oh, my God, we've never seen that. We're going to take care of it. Everything's going to be fine. And they eventually closed, too. They, I don't think they could really recover. And prices went up. You know, there was a Yeah, we're going to take parts. care of the rats in Chinatown real quick. <laughs> yeah. Just gonna, we're just going to get rid of those. Dude, this is – they're not going anywhere. Like, they – this is their home. We're just – passing through man uh rat this is ratchet rats and roachesville ratches um but like just to talk about the food part of it and like food trends like i've been kind of really bummed out on uh like the the white wheat restaurants that like Xi'an Famous Foods made popular. So there's this place that makes these tour noodles that everyone loves. Bourdain made famous on his show. And there's big, weedy noodles mixed in with, like, cumin and spicy lamb. And they're delicious. And it's a craze. So, like, people started lining up. Anybody who was attached to the Internet loves was like, I need to try this dish. And as Yeah, I think even, um, like, Eater still has that as, like, one of the most, like, iconic New York restaurants. It turns out it, it ends up being as famous as Shake Shack or a Chang's, like, a uh, bun or a, a Katsy the, within, sandwich. Right, within, like, the the eater, foodie, cognoscenti. Like it's a big deal. Going, going, to, going there, is a, it's a pilgrimage that if you couldn't make it out to Queens, mm-hmm. then you'd go to the one that's in the East Village, and yeah. they open one uptown. They have one now in uh, Greenpoint mm-hmm. on Manhattan Avenue. So it's, it's a Marks. chain. Yeah. And... St. Mark's is the Chinatown. Yeah, that's the one that I always went to. And like, and this is a deeply Chinese thing that I think we've talked about before. It's just like, so I think Chinese people see the success of Vanessa's or Xi'an Famous Foods. And instead of being like, oh, we're going to set up next door and offer like barbecue or some other thing, they set up next door and offer the same exact thing. They copy it. And that's just a way to do business, I think, in a parts of the world. Um, successfully, you know, that's what prosperity did when Vanessa's got big and my, I'm bummed out now because I love to hang out in Queens and eat food in, in all those malls. And you see a lot of these like flour, wheat based dumpling noodle places everywhere. And, and for me, like, it's such a complicated experience, like eating food from far away places because like sometimes it's like a cone of diversity. Like, sometimes you get something that works, someone hits it, and everyone changes their menu to copy it. And uh, it's lost on my, like, palate now, my mouth. Like, I just don't crave that stuff anymore, and I'm like, I really pine for, like, a different idea. But it's it's still happening. This weedy, flowery kind of, like, cheap dumpling thing is still around New York City, for real. Yeah, I don't really know what the ecosystem is in, in Queens in terms of when one place becomes popular that it shifts this sort of terrain that's going on before it gets to Manhattan. I feel like that's kind of interesting is yeah. that it's like, Oh, okay, this is what they're eating in Manhattan, but it does it, does it trickle down or does it only go one direction? I have no idea. The most interesting restaurant I went to recently was I went to Ada, which is in Queens. Mm. Maybe it's at I don't know if it's Ada, whatever, but um, it's an Indian restaurant in Long Island city. It's definitely registering high on the foodie charts we got there around seven waited about half an hour without a reservation but people who got there minutes after us were waiting an hour an hour and change small you just wanted it more man i we we were clutch (laughs) walking in the door slightly ahead of other people slap those water glasses killer instinct yeah um really good though i thought it was i thought it was incredible yeah i want to go very interesting very spicy um like lots of interesting curries, but it was also so noisy in there that it really gave you the sensory overload and the food came out very hot in terms of actual temperature. It was not easy to sort of, kind of the way we're saying, how do you judge a garbage plate when you're not 12 claws deep? <laughs> right, it was sort of right. like that. Like, I don't know what this food actually tastes like without it being deafeningly noisy from people shrieking around me and being piping hot. Like, I don't know what it's like to eat it. Yeah, and it's like, I always think about one of my buddies telling me, like, I didn't like Anchorman the movie. And he was just like, well, see it five or six more times this week and then get back at me. And that's how food is, right? Like, however funny that idea sounds, it's like, Unfortunately, I probably have to try this Popeye sandwich again and again to figure out how I feel about it. I don't really care. I love it. That's probably the last one I'll have. But like 
what you're getting at with like the the Indian food thing is interesting, right? Because Curry Lane in in Manhattan kind of isn't there anymore. Like there used to be, what is it, Seventh uh, Street? I forget where, uh, which street Curry Lane is on, but there used to be like every shop used to be an Indian restaurant. Now there's like one or two. And I remember reading, I think this is a good update because I think we talked about this years ago. I was looking up Chinese restaurants in the East Village and somebody on, I believe like Bowery Boogie or one of these local blogs was just like, can we get less Chinese restaurants, specifically less noodle shops? I'm done with it. Can we get some diversity in here, like Indian food, Ethiopian food, Thai yes, food, yes, anything? Yes, I agree. But then I, I, I disagreed because I was like, <laughs> it's a free market. If these places, if we don't want them, they'll go away. And they went away. They lasted less than a year. Yeah, well, that's true too. I just mean as a consumer versus someone who's dictating the market. I'm in agreement with that though. Guys right? like even with bars, I'm like, well, every single bar, does it need to have like the same lighting fixture? Does it need to have the same two cocktails? Like let's move on. Right. And now we're seeing with a design aesthetic, yeah. everything in white, everything with subway tiles, everything with you it's know, a sweet green cacti vibe. and plants. Right. Yeah. Every every restaurant looks like a sweet green, which looks like a coffee shop, which looks like which was a southwestern rug <laughs> right. emporium. Which was a reaction to like the taxidermy thing that Tavo did at Freeman's Alley, right? Like absolutely, it's just a complete reaction. And I always think about that in terms of the NBA because this is an NBA podcast, the best NBA podcast. Is like you don't want every team to have twin towers. You don't want two Davises or like Eddie Curry and Tyson Chandler. But to have a couple of those teams with that is really exciting. So you don't want, like, point of view to be homogenized. And that's why, like, we always talk about Popovich being so kind of wonderful. It's like, uh, everyone's going three and D. All right. I'm going two. I'm going to isolate value in the market and just go for, like, mid-range. But it's the only way to win. Yes. Because right. if you have the most talent, doing the same thing as everybody else is your absolute best bet. Mm-hmm. Like, you can do other things, but if... If if me and you are are playing basketball and we play and identically dominating. and I'm and I'm better at basketball, then I'm going to win. If we're playing and we have the same and we have different skill sets and you play totally different, you can beat me. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think is interesting about the NBA now. And you know, there's a this sort of boomery critique that oh, everybody plays the same. It's all threes. It's all this. It's like, no, it's not. Yeah. It's not. There are certain principles. You need to take more threes because they are worth more than two. But then, like, uh, but back most to, teams, most teams aren't playing the same. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. And like, that's what I mean by like. I think we strive for diversity correctly as an instinct, but it kind of does it by itself. Um, but I want this is a stretch, but I want to equate like the Popeye sandwich to a player like Zaire Smith because the Popeye sandwich is just a copycat sandwich, right? It's it's it was invented to compete against Chick Fil A. Specifically, it was uh, designed to take a market share away from a competitor. And Zaire Smith is a player that, like, we've been pining for and other teams have. But he, he's not necessarily different than an antiquated point of view. And But what I mean by antiquated is, like, two or three years. Like, this idea of 3 and D. But he's still better than, it seems like he's better than another option. So we accept it. And we're excited by it because we know how to frame it and talk about it. If it's, like, a new sandwich that... Like our our buddy, uh, our buddies who do superiority burger, like they're introducing new things all the time that like we have not seen on earth. It's hard to frame, right? Other than just being like, that's one of the best restaurants on the planet. It's like, well, how's their Yuba sandwich? I'm like, I can't compare it to anything else. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm I'm endlessly redundant, but bringing up Zaire, Ben Simmons, Giannis. I think you can look at those players and say, this is a prototype that does not need to abide by pace and space in the way that it's been viewed in the past. That we can look at this new environment and say, these guys can thrive because of this environment, despite having a skill set that seemingly is counter to it. And that's what I think is interesting about Giannis being MVP. That when everyone's complaining about the league being completely homogenous and everybody shooting threes and doing all this shit. 
the MVP can't fucking shoot. Like, I think that's awesome. I love that. And that's why I'm love excited about, Z- uh, about Zion. Yeah. I might have said Zaire before, who I'm also excited about. The letter Z, man. That's what I love about Zion. When you have the boomers hand-wringing about, yes, but can he develop a three-ball? Doesn't matter. Does not matter. If he can't, it's cool, because you can find someone who can shoot at every other position, and then you can let him do his thing. And as evidence, we have the MVP. It's basically the new test case that we got with Golden State, when everyone said, well, you can't win a championship shooting threes, and then Golden State wins, and now... You're like, yeah, but uh, uh, now it's like, well, the MVP can't shoot threes. So what are you talking about? And you know, like you don't need to do this. It's, it's not a skill set that is mandatory. It's a skill set that is useful. It's great. But you can find other guys to do it and then do what you do best, which is everything else. And this is like a cookies theme, right? It's just like these players don't have to be the totality of our projected desires onto them. Like – all these players have certain weaknesses, and we harp on players like Kyrie Irving or Ben Simmons for things that like everyone is guilty of, which is not being perfect. And, and Giannis is a great example of that because I don't think you would see you talk to any casual fan and have a disagreement. I think you would come on the same page or you would you arrive at the same point, which is like he's amazing, but he probably should Stop but shooting. what's interesting is with Giannis, because he's so good, and because he chucks up threes that I mean, it's bounce laughable. off the backboard at, at at terrible, weird angles and and smash the apparatus throughout the stadium <laughs> with his bricklaying. But because he takes some, everyone's like, "Well, yeah, he could be better at that." But he's awesome. And look at back to Shaquille O'Neal. The way that people talked about him when he was dominating the NBA is... Can't shoot free throws. Can't shoot free throws. Like, anyone could do what he does That's if okay. they were as big as him. End up being imagine a top if five like, player all the time. Imagine if someone else had his skill set. You know, he can't shoot. And, and this, oh, this, point, gets this in, happens yeah. all the time. It happened with Wilt Chamberlain yeah. long before basketball even existed. <laughs> the NBA. They were, they were uh, workshopping what would eventually be the NBA in 1996. Yeah, they were just throwing snowballs through <laughs> peach baskets or some shit. Yeah. No, but I agree, and it's just like, oh, I lost my train of thought. But, like, uh, yeah. You need some sort of middleman here? <laughs> give you a portal to some better takes? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I thought, I, thought you were the, I thought you were the take factor over there. <laughs> I got terrible takes, man. But, uh, all right, I think we're done, man. Okay, well, we're just going to wrap it up because close out of takes. Um, fresh out, fresh out. Well, that was a two-hour monster cookie session. And uh, the next week, Jordan Rodelli will be... Are we doing two weeks now? Do we want it more? Let's do it. Cookies. Cookies. Thank you.